Hey guys, before we get into today's video, I wanted to let you all know that this Monday, August 1st, myself and Rampage will be playing at Morongo, my home casino about 10 minutes from here. We're going to be jumping into a 5-10 game. Uh, it's not a meetup game or anything. We're not going to be moving tables. But if you guys want to come out, say what's up, maybe hang out, get in the game. That's the time and day to do it. I think we'll be starting around noon or so. Uh, yeah, that's the quick announcement. Let's get into the video. Right, so as you guys can probably already recognize behind me, we are in a familiar setting here in Gardena, California. And if you've seen a few of my videos, you know this means some big games. Right, so here I am back at Hustler Casino to play on streams. And today is actually my second day of two different live streams. This vlog will cover both of those, but the first one happened last night. And uh, I guess it kind of just went the way things have been going for me on stream. A whole lot of nothing going on. Well, I guess I shouldn't spoil it too much. Let's go into those hands and then I'll also cover a few hands I played after that stream. Let's go. All right, guys, here we are starting off the vlog with stream number one. This game was a 5-5 with a 100 ante. You guys have heard me mention this before. It's essentially a 25-50, sometimes even bigger, depending on the straddles. Anyway, I start the night off with $50,000 and get involved early on with pocket tens from early position. I raise it up to 200 and get immediately re-raised by Wesley on my left to 600. Now the actions on Mike on his left, who decides 600 or 200, are both not good enough, and instead kicks it up to $2,000. After Nick folds pocket jacks in late position, action gets back to me and I've got a decision to make. Now, on paper, I think pocket 10s uh, is pretty much an easy fold here. But having said that, I've played against Mike a fair amount, and there's just certain things that are a little bit difficult to describe that led me to believe that pocket tens could easily be the best hand here. He also doesn't have a lot left behind, so I think getting it all in with him isn't too much of a concern, especially considering that I think, like I said, pocket tens could be ahead. Of course, sometimes I'll be wrong, but I'm willing to live with that. However, the catch here is that Wesley's left to act behind me and he's got a lot more behind than Mike does, so being wrong could be a lot more expensive with someone like that left to act. With that in mind, I decide to perhaps proceed with the unorthodox approach and just call, see a flop and go from there. Wesley decides on the same and the three of us go to a flop of queen a4. I check, Wesley checks, and now Mike sends the rest of his stack in the middle, which is a considerable bet relative to the size of the pot, almost $10,000 all in. Now the action's back on me and I still have this read that I think pocket tens could be beating Mike. At the same time, Wesley is left to act behind me, and although I think it's a bit difficult for him to have a queen, he certainly could, or even have a hand like pocket jacks or something that might call as well that, you know, has me in bad shape. At the same time, if I were to call, perhaps Wesley could fold a hand like jacks or maybe a weak queen, but I don't know, it seems like all the stars have to align at this point for me to win the hand, so after a few moments, I decide to just fold. And good thing I did because Wesley had ace queen, so he flopped top pair, top kicker. No surprise that he does pretty quickly make the call, and tens would have been in pretty bad shape. So a little bit of an interesting hand to start off the night, but this one's not going our way. A little while later, this hand comes up where Victor raises to 200 from early position. I'm next to act with queen eight suited, and typically I think in middle position you could just fold this hand or perhaps raise with it. But after a few players fold out of turn behind me, I decide to make the call, and the two of us go to a flop of ace-queen-5 with two hearts. Looking pretty good for me, I've got middle pair and a flush draw, so when he continues with a small bet, I happily make the call. I think raising is, I guess, an option, but on a board like this, he's typically going to be a lot stronger than me, so I just call in position, 
And we get a decent turn. It's the ace of spades, making it less likely he's got an ace. However, when he continues with a small bet, I still don't see any merit to raising. So once again, I make the call. And we sort of get there on the river, but not really how I wanted to. It's not a heart, but it is an offsuit queen, giving me bottom full house. At this point, Victor checks and it's on me. Now, I'm fully aware that the standard play here is to just check back. Obvious question is, what worse hand is going to call? And even though I do agree with that line of thinking, I am a fan of trying to get some value in spots where the majority of people wouldn't, even, you know, to the point where it's borderline questionable. And this is one of those moments. I think he could be betting a hand like pocket pair below the ace, maybe even a worse queen that at this point could consider folding. I know it's a little bit thin and a little bit ridiculous, but like I said, I'm okay with going for some thin value in spots where it might be a little bit foolish. As you can see, this is one of those spots because my opponent's got an ace. However, I do put in a value bet of $2,000. In terms of sizing, I think going big or checking back are pretty much the only options. And after a few moments, he check raises to 6,000. Easy decision for me here, I let it go and we lose a little bit of extra money that didn't necessarily have to go into the pot. So things are not going very well to start off the stream. Let's see if we can turn that around with pocket aces. I raise it up to 300 and get three different callers. So there's gonna be four of us going to a flop, which is miserable for me. It's four, five, six with two clubs. I have aces with no club. On a board like this against three opponents who called a pre-flop raise, I'm not really feeling good about one pair, even if it is the best possible pair. So after Victor checks, I check as well. Wesley does put in a bet of $1,000. Dustin calls behind him. Victor folds and now it's back on me. Already not loving the situation, but feels ridiculous to fold aces at this point. So I do make the call and the three of us go to a turn, which is bad to worse. The 10 of clubs. Now any potential flush draw is completed. I check it again. Wesley does not. He instead bets $3,000. And after Dustin calls, I'm pretty sure aces are in last place, maybe second place. But as you guys know, only first place wins the money, so I let it go. And as it turns out, we were up against two different flushes. Once again, not going to be winning this one, even with pocket aces. All right, moving right along, maybe fourth time's the charm. In this one, there's a limp from early position before Mike makes it $300. Victor calls on his left, and then it's on me with pocket sixes. Mike's got a short stack, and Victor called, so I think this is a good opportunity to put on the squeeze play. Sixes are going to be in good shape for the most part, so I make it $1,300. Gets back to the original raiser who folds, but Victor makes the call again, so pretty much a best case scenario. And we go to a decent flop as well. Jack four deuce with two hearts, only one overcard to my pocket sixes. When he checks, I still think we're going to have the best hand most of the time, so a bet is in order. We can also protect from a lot of turn cards that are not going to be looking too good for my measly middling pair. So I put in $1,000 right around a third the size of the pot. My opponent calls, so we go to a turn which is the seven of spades. Now when he checks, I think I'm happy to check back and get to showdown, see what he wants to do on the river, which is the four of spades. Pairing the board and also bringing in backdoor spades, which for the most part I think are just irrelevant. What's interesting now is my opponent goes out and bets $4,000. Now, this bet doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I feel like if he had a jack, he would probably check since it looks like I either have him beat or nothing at all. So I don't really understand the value in betting a jack. If he has a four, obviously a bet makes sense. But I don't know. It seems a little bit interesting to me. There's a lot of missed draws out there and a lot of hands that he floated the flop with also don't improve. Perhaps hands like suited connectors that don't improve or maybe just a naked flush draw since there are two hearts on the flop. It does suck that I have the six of hearts, since that's one of the cards I would hope he's bluffing with, at least sometimes. But I don't know, his play doesn't make a ton of sense to me. At the same time, I could easily have some better hands to call with than just pocket sixes, but when it's close, you guys know the MO. And especially so when the night is going not very well for me, perhaps a little bit of frustration eking into this decision making. I like to think not, but I'm just keeping it real with you guys. Anyway, you could probably guess where this is going. After a few minutes, I do make the call. And we're up against King Queen of Spades for the optimistic call on the flop, which ends up improving to a fairly disguised flush. So nice hand, Victor. We lose another one. So as you guys can tell, I've lost every considerable pot so far. Let's see if we can finally turn it around, this time with pocket nines. In this one, there's a limp from early position. I raise it up to $300. Wesley calls on my left, and then Mike in the big blind makes it 1500 He still got around, well, not a whole lot, a little less than $10,000 to start the hand. When it gets back to me, I think you can make a case for just trying to get it all in or making the call in position. 
With Wesley behind me, I think both options are on the table. This time I just decide to call as does Wesley. So the three of us go to a flop of 6-5-3 with two hearts. Pretty okay for me, I think. Yes, I do have an over pair, but I do have Wesley left to act behind me who could easily connect with this board in a variety of ways. When Mike checks, I decide to get a little bit cautious and check it. Also under rep my hand a little bit, which should make it easier to play. But Wesley disagrees with all that and instead bets $3,000. Around two thirds the size of the pot, definitely not a small bet. Now Mike lets it go, so I think he had a big ace. And now we're left with a decision with pocket nines. Considering that we're very, very deep, I don't really think check raising makes a whole lot of sense. We're probably only getting called by better hands if I were to do that, so I make the call, and we go to the seven of hearts on the turn. Now, this is the point in the hand where things get a little bit weird. I've been experimenting with a few different ideas, trying to think outside the box, and always add new tools to the repertoire. So that's what I decide to do here with a small block bet. I've been doing some research. It turns out you can do this with cards that are beneficial for you. And I do think the seven of hearts applies. I could have some flushes or some two pair combinations. Occasionally I'll have a four as well. So with all that in mind, I bet $1,000 right around 10% of the pot. Wesley makes the call. So interesting development so far as we go to a river, which is the five of spades. I'm gonna admit at this point in the hand, I wasn't too sure where I stood probably because I played it in such a way that I'm not very accustomed to. So I decide to block bet again, this time $500, hoping to get called by a worse hand. It might look like I'm trying to induce a raise at this point, which is what Wesley ends up doing to $10,000. But in reality, I wasn't too happy with this. I feel like he's got a lot of hands that beat me and very few that don't. He'd also have to be turning a pair into a bluff for me to win at this point. So I don't think about it too long and let it go. As it turns out, he did have one of those hands, but like I said, I didn't think this would be too common. Unfortunately, this time it does not work out for me, and I'm also not in love with the way I played it. Could definitely have gone a more traditional route and perhaps won this one, but once again, things not going my way, and also not super happy with how I'm playing, so with that out of the way, let's keep it going to the next hand where I pick up Jack-10. That's right, going from one marginal hand to the next. In this one, Victor opens to $600. There must have been a straddle on or something and I make it 2,000 on his direct left. I've got Jack-10 suited, usually a hand that could go either way, but since everyone's very call happy at this table, I decide to try to play in position heads up with a hand like this, which is exactly what ends up happening as Victor makes the call. We go to a flop of King-6-7 with one club. Pretty good one for me with a king out there and a club. I don't have any showdown value, but this board's all right for me, so when he checks, I continue with the small bet, $1,400, and after a little bit of thought, Victor makes the call. The turn gives me some help in the jack of spades. We improved to second pair, so now we are beating some hands that call the flop, like, you know, any pair smaller than the jack. But when he checks again, I think now it's okay to check back and try to get to showdown, probably not getting called by a worse hand multiple times, so that's what I do. And we see the seven of spades on the river. Similar to the first hand I played against him, backdoor spades come in, and the board pairs one more time. And once again, Victor comes out and bets $4,500. Similar to the last hand, we've got some showdown value. This time I think my hand is a little bit better to call with than the pocket sixes earlier. So once again, when the spot's close and I think I could win often enough, I make the call. And this time it does work out as Victor flips over pocket fours with a spade. So finally one going our direction. Definitely not enough to crawl out of the hole, but I'll take it. And that brings us to the last hand of this particular stream where I open seven five suited from early position and get called by Wesley on my left and Victor in the straddle. Three of us going to a flop of queen eight four with two spades. Once again, I flop a whole lot of pretty much nothing. I do have an open-ended straight draw, but that's about it. However, I feel like I can get away with some aggression here since I've been pretty card dead most of the night, so I start off with a $1,000 bet. Wesley calls on my left. Not surprising, he's been flopping stuff all night. Victor does get out of the way, so two of us going to a turn, which is the king of spades. Now, I feel like this card is better for me. I feel like at least sometimes, if not very often, Wesley would be raising in position with a flush draw if he had flopped one. So I feel like I could easily have a flush, whereas he's mostly going to have a hand like top pair or perhaps an eight. For that reason, I decided to continue betting here. I've got no showdown value and who knows, maybe he'll fold a pair. So I put in around two thirds the size of the pot, $2,200. And what do you know, after a few seconds, Wesley ends up folding a queen. So not the biggest pot ever, but feels like a moral victory at this point. Anyway, for the rest of the stream, which was around two more hours, I picked up pretty much nothing interesting. I did end up bleeding away a few more chips as the blinds went around, but that pretty much concludes this one. Right, so I ended up losing around $15,000 on stream, which given the size of the game is really not that much. 
it's kind of the nature of being card dead for a while and not winning any huge pots. However, after the stream, I did play a very big pot. I had pocket kings against Ryan Feldman, the owner of the show, who jumped in when the stream ended. Long story short, we were playing shorthanded. Uh, he opened, I re-raised from the blinds. He put in another raise. I put in another raise myself. He flat called and we went to a flop of eight, three deuce rainbow, pretty dry board. Given how many raises went in before the flop, this shouldn't really change anything. So I'm happy to continue with a bet of $5,000. At which point Ryan decides to raise it up to $15,000 might have been 13,000. I forget the exact amount, but long story short, he raised it up. I make the call and we go to a turn which pairs the bottom card. Once again, a complete brick. I check and now he decides to move all in for his remaining 30 or $40,000. <sighs> Not a very fun spot, but Folding Kings is just a ridiculous concept, especially against a player who's capable of playing hands that are not pocket aces. So after a little bit of thought, I make the call, now playing an over $100,000 pot, easily the biggest pot I've ever played. And what do you know, we're up against pocket aces. He asks to run it twice, I say sure. No king on either board, and just like that, I lose a huge pot. Then right after that, I lost with king jack versus queen eight. Uh, I had top pair, or rather I turned top pair, but he makes two pair on the river, so. I guess that's how last night went. A whole lot of run bad for myself, and that's what it takes to have the biggest loss of your life, which I did, right around 80 or $90,000. Brutal, heartbreaking, and uh, the cherry on top is that today I'm supposed to play again. We're playing 50, 100, 200, pretty big game, and it's supposed to be against, uh, I don't know, I guess a somewhat tougher competition. So yeah, your boy is not in the best mood or in the best mental state to play tonight but that's the nature of the beast and i'm definitely not going to back away from something i committed to already which was tonight's stream so with all that said let's jump into tonight's hands hopefully it doesn't go as terribly as last night wish me luck talk to you guys after With that said, let's move on to the second stream. This one's going to be a 100-200, often with a $400 straddle, so a very sizable game for myself. And because of that, I sit down with $100,000, easily the biggest buy-in I've ever had, and that's why it's worthy of the title. We're going to start this one off with King-10 suited in early position. I open it up to 500. Dustin calls as a big line, as does Ruske in the straddle. By the way, if I'm butchering that name, apologies in advance. Anyway, the three of us go to a flop of ace, nine, deuce with two spades. Looks like a good one for me with an ace out there, and I've got a flush draw, so for that reason, I continue with a bet of $500. Dustin fold, but Ruske calls, so two of us go into a turn, which brings no help. It's the ace of diamonds, not necessarily the best card in terms of credibility, since now it's a little bit harder to represent the ace, but at the same time, I think I could get away with continuing with a small bet. I would certainly do the same if I did have an ace or pocket nines, for example. So with that in mind, I bet $800, around a third of the size of the pot. And now Ruska decides to check raise to $3,200. Already not a fun spot, but what am I going to do with two overcards to middle pair and a flush draw? A lot of outs if he doesn't have an ace or a full house already. And if we make a flush, who knows, we might win a little bit of money. So I make the call. And we get no help on the river. It's the five of hearts. Now Ruske bets some amount, I think $13,000. Considerable size relative to the size of the pot. Not really sure what he's up to here. If I had an ace, I would definitely call. But with king high, not much I can do. I let it go. And as you guys can see, my friend here was bluffing with three pairs. Pretty good play by him. But as it stands, three pairs still beats king high. So nice hand, sir. In this one, we are once again going to stray off the beaten path where I raise queen eight suited from early position to 500 and get re-raised by Ruske on the button to $2,200. Now, I know what you're thinking. Queen eight suited is probably not a raise from early position and it's definitely not a hand you wanna call a re-raise with out of position. And to be real with you guys, I couldn't agree more, but I decided to call for a few different reasons that I'd rather not get too specific with, but mainly I didn't think he had anything too strong. So we go to a flop and I'm just thinking I could probably outplay him. And I also open from early position so I could represent some over pairs and, you know, credible stuff. Not sure how much merit there is to anything I just said, but I'm just telling the story. So we go to a flop of 10, 6, 3 with two spades and one heart. I check and he continues with a small bet. This is the point in the hand where I think you can make a case for folding and pretty much only folding. 
That being said, I decided to check raise to $6,000. The reason I did this is A, because I hadn't really played any hands, so I felt like I had a good image to do it. And B, I didn't really think he had anything strong. Like I said, I picked up a couple of things before the flop. But even with that being true, I still don't think this is a good play. I could just have so many better hands to do this with. There's not even a diamond out there. This is just a straight airball bluff, which I pretty much never do. So if I did want to start experimenting with something like this, the biggest game of my life is probably not the best opportunity to do that. So yeah, I've got a little bit of regret with how I played this one, but that's okay. I'm not in love with every pot I play on a regular basis. So anyway, getting back to the hand, Ruske makes the call and we get bailed out on the turn. It's the queen of clubs, most likely giving me the best hand, but because I've played this hand in such a weird way, now it's hard to even know where I stand. I still think a bet makes sense though, so I decide to bet half pot. Doing this with good hands and bluffs seems fair to me, so with a medium strength one, I guess you could also make the same argument. Like I said, still not super sure about this hand. I haven't looked into it very deeply since playing it, but I do put in $8,000, and once again, my opponent takes a little bit of time before making the call, so we're off to a river now. I'm fairly confident we've got the best hand, but when the ace of clubs comes out, I don't see us getting value from a worse hand, and in fact, I think we're going to be beat fairly often now by either kings, aces, maybe even pocket queens or a stronger queen like king, queen of spades. For that reason, I check it, and after a few seconds, he checks it back. That's not really a good sign for me, I think. I guess we are beating hands like pocket jacks or jack 10 suited, king 10 suited perhaps, but seems optimistic, and indeed it is because we end up losing to ace, deuce of spades. Seems fair enough. The best hand ends up winning in the end, and I'm left scratching my head about why I played this one in this particular fashion, but such is life. In this next one, I get ace-jack suited in early position, raise it up to 500, and get three different callers. Finally, for the first time in two days, I connect very well with the flop. It's king-jack-jack with two spades. However, be that as it may, I think checking multi-way is the best play here, so that's what I do, and now Dustin bets $2,000. Both of the other players fold and now it's back on me. Once again, I'm gonna describe a somewhat interesting approach here, but in theory, I think check raising on this board doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but in practice, it seems like the best play. Dustin's probably got something if he's betting into three opponents and it's a pretty big size. I've definitely got him beat unless he has a hand like King Jack or Pocket Kings, both of which are extremely unlikely. So yeah, in terms of getting as much money in the pot as possible, I think check raising is the best play. However, like I said, in theory, I believe just calling makes a lot more sense. So that's what I do this time. And we go to a turn, which of course is the eight of spades. So now if he was bluffing with the flush draw, we are losing. Luckily for me though, he doesn't bet too big, only $3,000. I'm getting direct odds, I think, to make a full house, and even if it's kind of close, we can still win a lot of money on the river if he were to bet a flush and we improve. So I make the call, and we see the king of diamonds on the river. Not the best card, I guess. Now if he somehow has a king, we're losing, and if he has a flush, he's not going to bet for value. I guess the only good thing about this card now is we are beating a flush, and that's what ends up happening. I check, he instantly checks it back, and we beat ace ten of spades. Once again, a frustrating result for me. Yes, we end up winning the pot and, you know, it is considerable, almost $7,000 in profit. But this pot could have been a lot bigger if I were to just have check raised the flop. Who knows, maybe Dustin would have even re-raised me again and we could have played a massive pot. But that's not what ended up happening. Hindsight is always 20, -20. Uh, I don't know, at least we won against the nut flush on the turn, so could have been worse. About an hour later, this hand goes down where there's a $400 straddle on and I open ace three suited from early position. Spades, to be exact. We see a call from Dustin on the button, as well as Ruske in the small blind and Stanley in the big blind. So four of us going to a flop, which comes queen, six, deuce with one spade. Pretty good board for me, I think. Shouldn't be worried about much aside from sets. Of course, players can have pairs, but I think we can win this hand with some continued aggression. So I start with a $2,000 bet. Should live pretty strong considering that I raised before the flop and now I'm betting into three people. And it seems like Dustin believes me, as does Ruske since they both get out of the way. Stanley is not quite convinced though as he makes the call, so we're looking for some improvement on the turn, which does come. It's the Jack of Spades, and it looks like a good card for me since I can continue to represent over pairs or maybe even a set or ace queen, hands of that nature, you know, king queen or better. So when he checks, I decide to bet $8,000 now sizing up, trying to apply more pressure. And this time we get the job done as after a few seconds, Stanley lets go of his pocket tens. And finally, I'm okay with how I played a hand and we end up winning a little one. So 
I'll happily take it, and maybe this is an indication of things going a bit better now. Let's put that theory to the test as Andy opens to $1,000 and I look down at King Queen Offsuit in the small blind. In a game with an ante that doesn't have any rake on the flop, I think calling out of the small blind is fine, especially with Offsuit Broadway cards like these, so that's what I do. And we go heads up to a flop of King 9-5 with two spades. Got top pair and a backdoor flush draw, so when he continues with the bet, I happily make the call and we see the jack of spades on the turn. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, I think leading small on turn cards that are good for you is a good idea. We could argue all day as to whether or not I've perfected this strategy. Let me be the first to tell you I definitely haven't, but it is something I've been trying, so that's what I do here by leading out $2,500. Andy immediately smacks me in the face and raises it up to $7,500, telling me to get my block bet the hell out of here. Now, I've got the Queen of Spades, which is a pretty good flush draw, and not only that, but it's actually a good card to have because it makes it less likely he's got a hand like Queen 10, which is a straight now, or a flush with the Queen of Spades. All these things are going through my mind as I make the call, and we see a 5 on the river. Shouldn't really change anything. At this point, he's really only representing a flush or nothing. So when I check and he bets around half pot, I think it's an easy decision here with the Queen of Spades in hand, so I quickly make the call. And what do you know, we're up against 5-4 of spades. So not the best results, but I do think he could have easily been bluffing with any hand that contains the naked ace of spades. As it stands, he did not have that, but instead three of a kind and a flush. So nice hand, Andy. By the way, I think it's worth noting that I grew up watching Andy and Garrett and a few of these guys play on stream. So finally getting to play alongside him was definitely a cool experience and an honor for me. Even though I did end up giving him a bunch of money in this hand, I was happy to get in a pot with him. At this point, I fold for about an hour, picking up pretty much nothing playable, until finally I look down at King Queen of Diamonds. The downside to this is that there's an open to 1200, a call on the button, and then a re raise from Yo Viral to 7200 out of the blinds. Now, let's see what's going on here. There's a raise from late position and a call on the button. Because of that, I think Yo Viral is going to be raising a lot of hands out of the blinds, trying to take this money down. Sure, sometimes he'll have a good hand, but he'll very often have hands like ace-jack offsuit, ace-10 offsuit, you know, bluffs, just stuff of that nature. And I think he's going to have those hands often enough to allow me to bluff with king-queen suited. It's got good removal to hands like ace-king, pocket kings, pocket queens, etc. So, fingers crossed that I'm not running into a good hand here. I decide to go for it by making it $16,400. A little over a min raise, but the reason I made it so small is because Yo Viral started the hand with around $55,000. So I want to be able to fold if he goes all in. If I make it too big, I'm pretty much going to be committed. So you guys can probably guess where this is going. Both of the players behind me fold, but after about two minutes, Yo Viral does not fold, but instead announces all in. I quickly make the fold, not interested in calling an all in with King Queen. And just like that, trying to make a play, we lose $16,000. That's the nature of these high stakes games. A pretty much nothing hand can cost a lot of money. <laughs> In the next fun hand of Texas Hold'em, I raise it up to $1,000, once again, over a $400 straddle. In this one, I've got Ace of Hearts and only get called by Andy in the third blind, who's got Ace Five of Spades. We go to a flop of King Nine Seven with one spade. Looks like a good board for me. And I've got some backdoor possibilities. So when he checks, I continue with a bet of $800. And he doesn't think too long before making the call, and we see the jack of spades on the turn. I feel like after calling a small bet on the flop, Andy could easily have hands like a 9 or perhaps a 7. He shouldn't really have a king too often, so I think continuing to apply pressure makes the most sense. With that in mind, after he checks a second time, I size up to $5,000. A little bit surprisingly, Andy calls once again. I gotta be honest, I did not expect this, but what do you know, we get bailed out as an offsuit 10 comes on the river, giving me a straight with just my 8. Of course, a queen makes a straight as well, which is a little bit concerning, and even more so when Andy decides to now lead for $12,000. Well, if he's got a queen, I'd bless him, but I'm not going to fold my eight, so I make the call. And we finally win one, as Andy was bluffing with a missed flush draw. Thank goodness, because I definitely needed this one. Things had not been going very well so far, but finally we get a big pot to get things going in the right direction again. And on that note, I once again am card dead for around two hours. So we fast forward all the way to this hand where I've got seven five suited, pretty much the best hand I've seen in a while. In this one, there's a race to $900 from Yo Viral. I'm on the button, so I'm happy to make the call, as do three other opponents behind me. So five of us going to a flop, 
at least we've got position with a hand that could hit some flops, right? And we kind of do. It's 873 rainbow. Middle pair looks pretty much amazing to me at this point. So when the action checks to me, I bet small. Jokes aside, I think this makes sense. If someone's got an eight, obviously it's not the best bet, but our hand could use some protection and it will be the best hand often enough. So I do bet $1,200 and what do you know, we get called by three opponents. So at this point, I'm not feeling too great about it. Somehow though, miraculously, as you guys can see, they all had a worse hand. So I don't really know how that happened, but I'm planning on checking back most turn cards until the five of clubs appears out of nowhere. A little bit of a dicey card as it does introduce some possible straights or maybe even a set, things of that nature. But for the most part, I think it's pretty good to continue betting on. People are going to improve on this card, but I still think 7-5 is a very strong hand. So when it gets to me, I bet $6,000, right around two-thirds the size of the pot. Bill Klein lets it go with his ace high. Dustin folds as well. He was looking for a 9, which did not come. But Ruzke is undeterred as he has now turned an open-ended straight draw with his pocket sixes, so he does make the call, and we see an ace on the river. He checks it a third time, and now we've got a decision to make about how much to bet, or even if our hand is worth betting. Now, if I had a bluff, I would definitely be betting, and for that reason, it's pretty much all the excuse I need to put in a value bet. In terms of what size to use, I think going big here is the only thing that makes sense. I'm not really going to be representing any thin value hands. I'm telling the story that I've got something really good or I missed. So with that in mind, I bet right around the size of the pot, $23,000, Ruske finally decides to let his hand go. I do think his hand is worth considering a check raise with, at least sometimes, but for the most part, he would have been raising a straight on the turn. So I understand his fold. And finally, we take down a pot after folding for a few hours. But alas, this was the last interesting hand I played on this night. Like I said, just not a whole lot going on for me. Also wasn't super happy with the way I played. Didn't really run very well. And all that amasses to a somewhat underwhelming stream. But like always, I still hope you guys enjoyed the hands. Well, as you guys saw, that didn't go exactly well for me either. Both days were extremely underwhelming. At least today was a little less violent. I was in for $150,000 and cashed out for 12,000 and change below that. So another loss here at Hustler and officially my biggest downswing ever as I just lost over $100,000 in 48 hours. This uh, poker life, this high stakes live stream stuff, it's not always so awesome. Um, but this is what I asked for, this is what I wanted, and these are just gonna be normal swings if I'm gonna be playing this big. So as always, thank you guys for watching. Uh, thanks for all the support, and hopefully we can turn things around pretty soon. All right, until next time, good luck at the tables. Peace.